saipu na sapa da karakia, a meino tātou. E te atu mātou i nei tarangi i whakawhetā ana mātou ki e koe mōtu mana ki tanga awhine te mātou i tēnei i tēnei ata, mō mātou kōrero i tā rānei. Mana ki te mātou whānau i maui ana ki tā tātou kāinga me ngā hohi pera katoa ko te wairu tapu te mātou riki āke āke āmeni. Just wishing rain and blessings over us today, thanking us for gathering here, also acknowledging, uh, wishing, well wishing for our loved ones that may be sick and at home and in hospitals, and um, rain blessings over us today. Kia ora. Kia ora, Tracy. Goodbye. Welcome all. Um, I'm Kerry Griffiths. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, a newly joined the ISCA family in Fano. Uh, as the technical director for that organisation. So it's with great pleasure that I join you all today as the moderator for this session. Um, the session which is part of the Connect NZ webinar series. So welcome to you all um, and welcome particularly to um, our panellists. Um, I'd just like to, before we kick off, um, acknowledge our sponsors. So City Railink, Mott McDonald and Surtex who have sponsored the uh, Connect the NZ series and our branding partner Vital Chemical. So thanks to all of those um, who have allowed and supported um, this series to be made available. Uh, so this is um, a, this series session particularly focuses on social sustainability, social procurement, um, and we have a fantastic uh, range of panelists who are here with us today who are going to share their insights, learnings, and knowledge. Um, and be available for questions uh, from those of you who are attending and participating. So this is, um, I think, as we uh, move forward in this new um, and increased kind of investment and in infrastructure as part of the economic recovery, we know that there'll be some real opportunities um, to make a difference for people uh, through our investment and through our procurement choices and decisions. And so a great um, uh, area to be kind of thinking about, to be learning from others on and to be considering as we move forward in terms of our own work that we do out there in the infrastructure world. And so welcome to our um, panellists, our four panellists. Um, we're going to explore the success that um, City Railing has had in the social sustainability area, particularly in regard to workforce opportunity um, and some of the exciting things um, that have been happening in this space and, and I'm sure that are planned for the future. Um, so Dr. Sean Sweeney um, will address us um, on the why and what of City Rail Link's approach in terms of their progressive employment program and Berenice Peter, who's the social outcomes manager for uh, Link Alliance. Um, will talk to us about some of the, I'm sure, share some of the experience of the how, what's happening on the ground and the uh, successes, maybe some of the challenges related to that as well. Um, and then following Berenice, um, Louise Aitken, the CEO from Akina Foundation, and then Tracy, who um, welcomed us here today from Ngāti Whātua or Kaipara, will also um, share his thoughts and experiences in this space. And the way that uh, the session will work is that we will um, go into presentation over the next um, while. Um, and then as we're doing that, feel free to use the chat function to make comments, um, to interact with one another. Um, we won't ask questions as we go through the presentations, but we will have Q&A at the end. And um, I'll direct you to the Q&A button to do that um, if we can, as we get towards the um, last 15 minutes or so of the session. Um, but please feel free to chat as we go. Um, before we open and hand, before I hand over to um, Sean Sweeney, um, we're just going to open with a quick poll. So um, that's going to come up on the screens now. Carlos is going to um, put that up for us. And let me just read out this um, question. Um, how do you rate the level at which social procurement is implemented by the infrastructure industry across Aotearoa New Zealand? Um, high medium or low. So if you just want to um, signal your experience at the moment as to um, you, what you perceive, what you've experienced out there, what your understanding is, 
um, that would be fantastic. And um, we'll give you a few seconds to reflect on that and to answer that poll. And then um, Carlos, I'll get you to bring up the response to that when you're ready. Okay, so that's uh, um, great to get that feedback um, from everybody and to see that response and it gives us a bit of a um, sense of where we think we are and where the opportunity is and um, which makes it an exciting session, I think. Um, so 59% people rated that as, or of those who responded, rated that as around medium, 41% low. So um, room for improvement and some real opportunities ahead of us, I think. Um, thanks, Carlos. So let me now um, introduce Dr. Sean Sweeney. Sean began work as the Chief Executive of City Rail Link um, in July 2018. He's an engineer with a PhD in Construction Economics from the University of Melbourne. After graduating from an engineering from the University of Auckland, Sean spent seven years working on the development um, of Tapapa in Wellington before heading overseas to work in the US and Europe and then settling in Australia. All of these sound, things sound sort of slightly unusual now as we contemplate um, the world ahead of us, I guess. Um, in Australia, he delivered a program of major infrastructure in Victoria and ran a top tier Australian construction company. More recently, um, implemented a $2.5 billion prison construction program in New South Wales. So Sean um, appointed to City Rail Link in July 2018. Um, Brian Roach, at the, the chair at the time, said that Sean brought a wealth of relevant and current experience to this position. Um, and that um, you know he's brought all of that experience to the work that um, he's currently leading uh, with his team at City Rail Link. Sean, let me hand over to you. Sean, have we got? Yeah, yeah. 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 cool. Kia ora, kata kata everyone. Um, uh, look, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the why. Um, the why we at City Rail Link are putting a lot of effort into trying to create a pathway uh, for employment into the construction industry for, uh, for disadvantaged youth with our progressive employment scheme. Um, the answer has a number of parts, but the two big issues that, that sort of drove this, um, certainly when I arrived back in New Zealand in 2018, um, it was very clear that the construction industry was short of resource, it needs, needs talent, it needs workers, and this is still a large issue, even though the government's now ramped up and we're going to have a much bigger infrastructure agenda. We're going to struggle to get workers, we're going to struggle to get skilled workers. So that was one issue. Um, second issue is, is um, even though I'm just relatively new back in the country, it, it appeared to me that we there is an issue. We have youth who don't know how to get into stable full-time employment. Um, and if you can't help our youth do that, the problems just multiply as, as they get older. Uh, there's a gap in the safety net, and it means people can fall through, and it's probably worse in disadvantaged areas. And I think New Zealand needs large organisations to look creatively at this to help address solve this issue. And it's very clear they need a model and a pathway that, that has been tried and that does get results. Against that backdrop, certainly in my experience, the construction industry. The politest way I could put it is, is it is very resistant to change. <clears throat> and if you leave the construction industry to its own devices, it'll generally do uh, tomorrow what it did successfully yesterday, and it won't change much from that. So there's enormous conservative forces in the industry to just carry on doing what we've always done. But if the industry is ever going to improve, it's, it's my very uh, strong personal view. Um, the big projects have an obligation and a duty to show leadership. 
because because they have the, the size and the horsepower and the footprint and the expertise to do things small projects can't do. Uh, so is, is New Zealand's biggest ever infrastructure project. We're also a huge employer. So we decided we could have a run at those two issues that I just talked to you about. Um, we believe we need to leave behind a legacy and that legacy needs to have many dimensions and we need to be a catalyst for raising the bar. I suppose you could turn the question around, if we don't try, who will? So we, we put, a, put a bit of acid on ourselves. And so what we're looking at doing is creating youth employment pathways to help address the construction skills shortage. And we've, we've decided as a group of people in subsidy rail, this is an area we can show some leadership. So we're trying to develop a, a model that can actually be copied um, because uh, you might have to take them back. There's an enormous desire uh, within companies to do something in this area, but uh, very few uh, know how to make a difference and they don't know the pathway to do that. So this is, I, th I believe there's enormous corporate goodwill. But we need to give people a way of directing that goodwill. Unfortunately, also in my experience, these sorts of initiatives often fall over due to a, a lack of executive support or a lack of know-how. So I, I think it's just a bit relevant to talk a little bit about my background, why, why this is so important to me. Uh, because I think if you can get your executive group uh, committed and motivated, it, it's a powerful message uh, that goes through the organisation. So, uh, my background, I, I grew up in Chile Bay in Pauru down in Wellington. Uh, when I was there, it was a very working class suburb. Lots of new New Zealanders. Uh, there were also lots of newly urbanised Maori. So it was a real melting pot. Um, but one thing that struck me, looking back, when I was eight years old, and you looked at the school photos of my classmates, we all looked the same. Um, we're cheeky, bright-eyed, somewhat mischievous kids. Oops, we've got, I think we've got a bit of a frozen screen there from um, Sean. Oops, here we go. Welcome back, Sean. Yep, we missed you for a bit, but you're back now. Okay, I'll, I'll just back up a little bit. I was just saying that when I was an eight-year-old, you couldn't separate me from my the other friends I had in my class. Um, and we're all sort of doing okay. By 16 or 17, something had happened. Um, some of those run up because of what I say, fall off the church, and some of them were seriously to harm. Um, and I... And I what happened? What happened to separate us out? I think there are lots of things that can conspire to trick good kids up. Um, I left school in year 11, but in those days, they were gentler times, and uh, it was easy to get a pathway back into to some sort of structure and employment and education. Um, I had the aspirations and the values of my, my wider family. <clears throat> But I knew the circumstances of some of my friends as we grew up, and I could see how they lost their way. And then I, there's a few questions. You know, what happens if you don't have that support and stability? What happens if you actually don't know how to get a job? Uh, what happens if your family doesn't have a contact base that can uh, get you an interview and put you in front of people? Uh, what happens if your home environment is so challenging that it's really hard for you to study? and keep regular hours. So at DRL, we've decided in a modest way to expend what I call discretionary effort, uh, creating an environment and a pathway for our youth, our own country, who do not have natural advantages to carry them automatically along. So the aim is to get them into entry-level full-time roles in the construction industry. Uh, I, I think we all believe in CRL. These sorts of initiatives are vital if we're going to be the country we want to be and the country we believe in and the country we're proud of. And I have to say it's something that a significant proportion of the staff at CRL really care about. Um, all I have to do is set the environment and get out of the way. Um, I've tried to do this sort of work in Australia and it's really hard. So we walked into this knowing how hard it would be, um, but we think the prize is worth it. And it's something as an organization, and personally we've, we've made 
are very important. We're not actually focused on the outcomes, we're focused on the effort. We think if we, if we do the, the effort or the, the mahi, uh, the results will, will occur. So we're very focused on, on doing the work. Uh, and to date, the results have been uh, very encouraging. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Um, it's so great to, um, I think, hear both in terms of the intention uh, of City Railing, but also the personal journey behind your position, because that, as you say, um, often the challenge for those who are working in this um, space and wanting to advocate is really connecting um, with their executive leadership and um, doing that in a way that's not um, just about the business case um, opportunity, but also the personal um, the personal why for people and um, the opportunity for um, people within our own communities um, and making that connection. So great to um, great to hear your thoughts in that space. Um, I'm now going to um, hand over to Berenice, Berenice Piata. Um, Berenice is the Social Outcomes Manager at Link Alliance, who are working on um, the main works for City Rail Link. I had the pleasure of working alongside Berenice uh, for a few months um, before I moved across to ISCA. So it's fantastic to welcome a friend and colleague um, to this panel. Um, Berenice is an experienced social outcomes manager and Māori cultural advisor um, with a demonstrated history of working in the construction industry and education sector. She's skilled in facilitation, coaching, negotiation, mediation and leadership and um, I can attest to all of those um, uh, having met the fantastic team that Berenice has pulled around her um, at City Rail Link. She's a strong community and social services professional with postgraduate master's degrees from the University of Auckland, University of Waikato, and um, Te Whare Wānanga o, o Te Aotearoa. Welcome, Berenice. I think Carlos is going to uh, put your slides up. I'll hand over to you. Tēnā rawa tu koutou, uh, tālofa, bonjour tu le monde. Ko Berenice Peita Tōku Ingoa, ko te kaipakahaere hua a Hāpore. Uh, my name is Berenice. I'm the Social Outcomes Manager for the Link Alliance. Uh, kia ora. So, I was a little bit overwhelmed by that introduction by Kerry. I was like, whoa, is that me? But, uh, <laughs> but kia ora. So, uh, just a, a little bit of background. I was introduced to the City Rail Link project in 2014. So I actually went there representing my iwi, Ngati Tata Waiohua, and I was part of the Mana Whenua Forum. So I worked there, I, I attended those meetings once a month on behalf of my iwi, and then in 2016, uh, City Rail Link advertised a job for a social development advisor and I applied and got that job. And then I started working for City Rail Link end of 2016 as the social development advisor. And then I wrote a social outcomes strategy. So looking at, okay, in this social outcomes space, uh, who, who, who are the people that this so social outcomes strategy is going to touch? So we like created a list, and so this big circle thing is a list of um, of different people that we thought were experiencing some kind of disadvantage or barrier into getting into the workforce. And I was like, oh, whoa, that that's a big list. That's a really big list. So then we looked, we decided we'd have a focus group. So that focus group is mana whenua, Māori, Pacifica, and youth. And Carlos, if you could take me to the next slide, please. All right, kia ora. So Sean talked about the progressive employment program that City Rail Link uh, piloted last year. So in the top corner, you'll see these 
six um, rangatahi standing in front of the city rail link, they were our six people on that, the pilot that we ran. And then uh, the next two photos going across the top, uh, Brendan is trialling a role on C1, contract one, as a dogman. And Simon was trialling a role as a traffic control on the C2 project on Albert Street. So that program was really focused around helping them to feel successful. So it started off, it was six weeks. They came in for 10 hours a day, uh, 10 hours a week, sorry, two five hour days, and that happened for six weeks. And over that six weeks, they gained confidence. They worked out what time they needed to get up to be at City Rail Link. Uh, they were organizing their lunch, what they were going to wear. There was lots of preparation and skills that they learned over those first six weeks. Then it transitioned to 20 hours a week. They're feeling a bit more confident. Uh, they were trialing out different roles. They were earning money. That, was, that made a, a really big difference to their lives. They were earning money. And then it went to 30 hours a week. So really helping them to transition into full-time employment. So they did their last, uh, the last six weeks at 30 hours a week, and there was a graduation. And of the six rangatahi, uh, five completed the program, one withdrew for personal reasons. And all of those five were offered full-time employment through City Rowling. So for me and for them, it, it was a success. It absolutely was a success. Now, if we come down to the bottom and you'll see the person with the big ass smile, his name is Saya Latu. And he is one of the owners of an, a company called Te Riu o Waikato, or more commonly known as Trow Group. So Saya Latu was commissioned to do a piece of what they call, fancy thing they call now, deconstruction. It's where you get to go into a building that's going to get demolished and you tag things that you can see, you can repurpose. So they went in and they took out things that normally it would just get bowled over and <laughs> it would get bowled over, but this they got, it got saved and it got sent away to, uh, to Tonga. So the social strategy really had four, four things. It was, Employment, training, social innovation, and you'll see in the middle too is a picture of um, some people doing Eat My Lunch, which Louise can talk about more in that social enterprise. And the last part was our future workforce. So that's a group of um, students down there. They're from SPI South Pacific Engineering, Engineering, Indigenous Engineering students. So we want to bring more Māori and Pacifica people into the workforce and more Māori and Pacifica businesses into the supply chain. Uh, kia ora, tēnā rā koutou katoa. Kia ora, Berenice. Very exciting, and I know that um, there will be many, many great things um, coming out of the work at City Rail Link. I'm thrilled now to um, introduce to you Louise Aitken. Louise is the Chief Executive at Akina Foundation. I'm sure she'll share more about the work of Akina. Um, Louise is a strong advocate for social responsibility and impact, driving to make meaningful change, to put positive impact at the heart of our economy. And um, what a great time to be doing that work. Um, Louise joined Akina in 2016 following a successful corporate career, which included management um, of New Zealand's largest corporate social responsibility program. Louise, let me hand over to you. Welcome. Uh, ina mana, ina reo, ina karangamaha Aotewa. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, uh, tēnā koe Tracy. Um, ko te au mairangi tō kutūranga waiwai, ko Aiken te iwi, ko McDonald's te hapu. 
no Punikiaho, uh, Kiakina Foundation Oi Mahiana, uh, Ko Louise Takamua, uh, Nori Ra Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Tina Koto Katoa. Um, thank you so much for inviting me along. Um, yeah, it, um, um, as has been said, this is the time, <laughs> no doubt, for um, for impact to be at the heart of our economy. Um, and um, uh, it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you uh, today about that. Um, I'm the uh, Chief Executive of the Arkina Foundation, and it's um, a pleasure to be here from my um, my bubble. Um, probably not a bubble, I'm enclosed, I like my bubble, so I'm enclosed in it, uh, on the Tinakori Hills in Poniki, Wellington, uh, my tūrenga waiwai. Um, Akina uh, is New, uh, Aotearoa's um, New Zealand's leading impact development organisation. Uh, we're a non-for-profit consultancy that helps organisations and businesses of all shapes and sizes uh, deliver more positive impact. Uh, today I'm going to talk about um, impact at the time of crisis and how we can all contribute to a new economy that we need and deserve, um, an impact-centred economy that works for everybody and for Papatua Nuku. Um, and I hope that um, by the end of this hour, uh, you will be challenged um, and uh, to and to be bolder in, in how we can all contribute uh, to this economy that um, we certainly need. Um, what we've seen as a time of, um, you know, over the last 10 weeks or so, uh, is New Zealand coming together. You know, we've been really um, focused on connecting to our community, listening to science, responding together to obviously um, get to a really great result so far in relation to COVID-19 and, and the health crisis. Um, but it's also um, put a, a, you know, a bit of a, a, a spotlight on something that has been very difficult uh, for a lot of people to accept. Um, and there is a bit of a difficult truth that you know, the New Zealand before COVID-19 wasn't so rosy. Uh, it's a New Zealand with unacceptable levels of poverty, inequality, carbon reduction targets that just seem inachievable as every day passes. Uh, and so we've had to all collectively ask, well, what's the new normal? Uh, as we recover from COVID-19. We know we're going to have unemployment rates that have, have not been seen in generations. Uh, we know that the new jobs that will be created will not be accessible to the people in most need, whether it's location, skill set, etc. Um, the ongoing costs of mental health um, will be hidden for many, many years to come. And we've all had to ask, how do we work um, and how do we live? And will it be fundamentally different as a result of this time? Uh, and that will be uh, physically different, fun, uh, financially different, emotionally different, and so, so what? You know, and I, I think it's a really important um, aspect for us. Um, Carlos, I'll just get you to flip through a couple of. Um, sorry, I should kind of highlight when the slide needs to be changed. Sorry, get to the next one. Um, yeah, that's all good. Um, when um, you know, we we want businesses to be profitable. Absolutely, that's an important part of our economic uh, recovery. Um, and yes, we want enough sec uh, secure jobs to provide for people uh, um, and their families. But we've got to do better than that. You know, simply avoiding the worst of this crisis isn't a vision for future in itself. And returning to the old ways of doing stuff will only increase the problems that we already had post COVID. We need new solutions for the new economy, and you know I think we can all um, understand the next statement. You know, if it's if it's not New Zealand, then where? Um, if it's not now, then when? Um, and how can our economy rise to this challenge? And how can we create an economy where people and the planet thrive? And in our view, this new economy, this the, our economic recovery, must be one that generates positive impact. It must be one that generates um, opportunities for everybody to thrive, for the planet to be able to recover and thrive for many generations to come. I'll get you to change the slide, Carlos. So what is impact? Um, for our point of view, and just for the point of, of view of this, it's around positive social and environmental outcomes that happen as a consequence, consequence of activity. And I'll move very, very quickly because I've just uh, checked the time. Um, what we want is a um, impact economy where we can have recovery and growth. Um, what, we will, what we really see it happening is, is in four areas. And Carlos, I'll get you to quickly go to the next one. We want an economy that supports organizations to run well, understanding and unlocking opportunities for impact. Those that are starting, start well work with the communities, understand what their 
um, problems are and the solutions that they believe they need and, del and, and work and co-design those um, solutions with them. We want our, our investment to be focused on not only returning financial returns, but also um, uh, impact returns. And really importantly, we need um, an economy that enables organisations to buy well. And that's absolutely at the heart of this. Um, and, and Sean talked about it. Social procurement is a significant lever for us uh, in our economic recovery. Um, we've got, um, Carlos, get you to go to the next slide. Uh, we've got $596 billion being spent by businesses. Might be slightly lower this year, but let's, let's base on, on the fact of last year. Um, sent, spent by businesses in their activities. We have about 45 billion, probably a little bit more now, um, for central government, um, and about 10 billion is being spent by local government. Imagine the power of this if it's enabling social and environmental benefit alongside the, the goods and services that are required and are being purchased. We've seen the growth of social procurement here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, with leading organisations, many in the construction space, probably many represented here today, who are already taking that step towards social procurement. We've got around $50 billion of social procurement spend within our social procurement program called Forward, and these organisations are taking leadership when it comes to actually understanding and incorporating social and environmental benefit within their supply chains. And the last slide I'll get to is one that I think is really important, is we all have an opportunity to be able to contribute to this. And my challenge to you is what are you going to do to contribute to the economy that we all need and deserve? As an individual, as an employee, really importantly, and clearly as a sustainability and infrastructure leader. So, Akina Mai, Akina Atu, challenge yourself and challenge others. And I'll leave it there. Sorry for running over. <laughs> Thanks, Louise. It's fantastic. Um, great to um, get, I think, you know, a very sort of clear vision and some real challenges to all of us, all of us around the panel and those participating today. Let me now finally um, hand over to introduce um, Tracy, but um, as Patrick has said, also um, for all of you who are listening in, um, this is your chance to be starting to contribute your questions um, as Tracy um, is speaking as well as we get to the Q&A. So um, Tracy, just briefly, um, Tracy um, is Mokapuna to Te Ruiti, who signed the Treaty of Waitangi um, on behalf of Ngāti Whātua, and he's affili affiliated to All Hapu at Ngāti Whātua, and sits currently on a number of boards and entities. Um, I'm going to hand over straight to you, Tracy. You can provide a bit more info for people, but I'm keen for you to share your messages with the team. Kia ora. Kia ora. Um, as, thank you, uh, Kerry. As um, Kerry um, said, that I'm a descendant of Te Rewiti. So Te Rewiti is, is the tūpuna who is standing, and beside him is Api Haikatawa. They were the two chiefs of um, Ngāti Whātua at the time. They, along with their cousin Tukina, and they signed the treaty in 1840. When they signed the treaty, they, were, they, signed, they agreed to a partnership um, with the Crown. And at that time, um, they, 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 they acknowledged their partnership by gifting 3,000 acres start the city of Auckland. Within 20 years, they'd lost most of their land. Um, and they had about maybe a couple of hundred acres left. So tell us, you go to the next slide. The next slide is actually their village down in Wakahu Bay, where our people live. Um, that was one of the last, the last remnants of our land. Um, and you may know it, and you may know it by the graveyard that's down there now in Wakahu Bay. So infrastructure hasn't been kind to our people um, in the past. And one of the um, one of the impacts is the next slide, uh, Carlos, which is the construction of the sewer pipe, which ran then ran right across in front of our village, and um, poured raw sewage straight out onto our um, our beach, and poisoned our pine one and our fishing bed. Uh, the next slide will show another picture of that. That's uh, so that's right up where our village was, the house, and as you know now we're coming to drivers for that sewer pipe sits under the stomach to drive. And I guess social procurement back in those days was my grandfather used to work. His job was to go down and, unfortunately, clear out stillborn babies that were washed down the sewers and through the through the pump station down there known as Amihita and buried them in our Udupa. So that was the extent of social procurement for my for my ancestors. Um, the next slide is a partnership that we're now working on. An example of us working together as a partnership on the Pūhōja Walkers Motorway, where we we went to NCCA, we said, 
hey, look, uh, we you listen to the significant sites here that you're going to be going through. How can we be engaged and we want to be here? So we we um, we actually employed about and trained about 20, 20 kaitaki that work as, as monitors and working on finding significant things. But also within that job, there's about 50, 50 whānau that were employed in other trades and other, other areas of construction and are still working there. The next slide, Carlos. So some of the work of our, of our um, kaitaki, so they, they work with the archaeologists. This is actually an ancient pit with, um, house which has never been seen, um, not that often, I haven't even seen that often in, in New Zealand. But it's actually about three or four houses and just where the red mark is at, at the red gate, that's actually the doorway. And then in the back is the fire pit. The next slide, Carlos, is one of our, uh, one of our ponga that was found. So this is an ad that's been found, uh, was found as a discovery. And, um, and and these this, these are the reasons why we why we um, why we have people on site and monitoring. The other thing is that we um, we've worked on developing cultural health frameworks, which were able to be implemented into the whole um, planning for the pro project. And it was around measuring Modi. What is the Modi? So we believe that everything has a life force. The Fenua, the water, the waves, um, everything, the Nahere, ourselves, we all have Modi. And it was around enhancing enhancing Modi, how do we do that? And um, and the way we did it was working with Western science. So we created these cultural health frameworks for Maori, um, yeah, the cultural health frameworks which was enhancing Modi. And our people were able to influence the project and the outcomes so that rather than just being an infrastructure project, it was um, providing better outcomes for the whole environment, from the mountains to the sea, and the way that we way that we treat the environment. So we walk for walk the waterways and um, and we're able to implement um, a lot of mitigation. So um, the next slide is um, we also were able to um, show our, our, our work on leaving our cultural footprint, um, showing that we, we could see ourselves in infrastructure. And this is the example, one of the examples here with one of the artists, Greg Keaton, he was involved in this bridge called Te Dehanga Whanau, which won some awards, design awards, but there's, there's actual designs that are within that. The next slide. This is uh, one of our whanauna that's actually carving a tuki, so similar to um, that, that one that was found, he's doing a sculpture. So we leave, we leave markers like that in, in different types of infrastructure, but this is actually social procurement as well, because it's getting work for our people, um, not only in the infrastructure, but in other, uh, other things for our kaitaki tanga, exercising our obligation to, um, to care for the environment and, and, and have these other outcomes. The next slide. Um, is, is one of the things around um, mitigating the impacts of the construction through trying to ensure that there are no runoffs into the waterways because these things do damage the, the, the um, you know the, the, the environment. So and, and and a lot of uh, most most of us are very good, but you can get some issues. Next one is um, the other area is not only infrastructure that we're looking at as well as the restoration of our of our harbours and our rivers, which the government is really pushing around environmental concerns. And I'm, I'm a negotiator on the Kaipara Harbour team, and we, you might have heard that we were mentioned in the uh, budget last week, and there's going to be an announcement coming up. Um, but it's all around keeping these cows and, and cattle out of the waterways, fencing it off and planting. And um, in the next four hour, four hour restoration program for the for the um, for the Kaipara Harbour, it's approximately uh, we need 1,500 fences, and we need a thousand guys planted. So it's a massive amount of, of work there, and, and everything else that rolls out of that. And it's not only one, it's not in Auckland, it's actually right around the whole Kaipara Harbour. So that's providing that, that social outcomes right around in small communities that are, are, um, have massive deprivation issues. And we can bring that work to them and help them set up businesses and collate things. Um, so that, that's a really healthy waterway for us. The next slide is um, what we're looking for environmentally. Yeah, you know, we're looking to be able to get fish, fish are healthy and then we're able to harvest the fish. So that's a healthy indicator for us. So we can eat the fish or the fish is surviving your breeding. And the next one, the next slide is actually we can actually swim in our waterways. So this is this is the this is the ultimate outcome that we can actually we're not at risk of going and swim in the waterway. So for us, social procurement is not only yes, we, we are very much looking at how we can um, sort of, uh, provide outcomes with, with CRL and all the other projects and jobs, but it's actually we, we want these other added benefits as well. And I think um, the, the opportunity now, and, and I really, really applaud what was said before the last speaker regarding do we want to go back to the normal uh, coming out of COVID? I don't want to go and sit on the motorway for another hour to go to, to get to work in the office, park, pay $24 for sitting in the park car park, and then buy back another hour. Well, 
and sit at home and do what we want to do and have less adverse impact on the environment. So I sit on climate change as well as one of the impacts, and this, these, are, these are things that we're looking at. Probably the exciting thing that Manapena was looking to do is set up a, a, um, a combined infrastructure project office where we will be able to respond to these shovel ready projects um, quite quickly, having technical specialists working with us historically, and alongside that, we'll be looking to have an economic development arm and training arm that'll actually corral a lot of those uh, funding opportunities that are going to be run. And it's going to be run collectively because if we try and do um, too much um, individually, we do protect too much of so the collectively. So, no data, Tena Kota, Tena Kota, Tena Kota, Tena Kota, Kia ora. Kia ora. Thanks, Tracy. Um, it's been so interesting to hear the real mix of experience amongst our team in terms of some of the kind of bigger picture thinking and also kind of what's happening on the ground. So, and particularly um, to hear in terms of mana whenua, some of the work that you've been doing and your aspirations. Uh, we have a number of questions coming through, so I'm going to um, going to go straight to um, one of those um, that was sent through. In terms of, Sean, you talked earlier um, about resistance to change and uh, um, the need to engage with executive leadership. And um, one of our participants has asked a question about um, advice that you might give, and this is really for all panelists, but Sean, I'll ask you first, and then others, if they want to contribute, um, advice to that you could give to people in terms of how to work with those people who are resistant to change and particularly um, you know the resorting to the financial business case to looking at the kind of lowest cost lowest price mentality so Sean let me hand to you first off. it's a very good question it's a very good question um, Look, the, this, that response has been around forever. I mean, I remember in the 1980s, people giving me the rational economic reasons why we couldn't have paraplegic ramps and buildings and it would bankrupt building owners and bankrupt industry and, uh, you know, and, uh, and then society moved on. Um, I think uh, all businesses have to turn a profit, otherwise they don't stay in business. And that's, that's just a fact. Um, but beyond that, there's a huge open, open field of discussion. And I, I, all I would say is, is um, the discussion somewhat idealistically needs to be, well, what kind of country do we want? Assuming you are making a dollar, and hopefully you might even be making two, what do you want to do about that? And uh, many, many initiatives we do don't actually cost the organisation much. Some do. And so that was one of the first things we decided when Veronese and I spoke is there's going to be some real money attached to these. Otherwise, it's just nice feelings. But you might have heard in my uh, comment, I use the word discretionary effort. I, and by that, I'd say that's the work you do on a Sunday afternoon on your dinner table. You roll out your stuff. It's, 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 it's not a cost to the organisation. And we made it clear that if this thing was going to go ahead, there had to be a discretionary effort. Um, but my, my top line experience is, the rational economic costs of this work over time are far less than people imagine. The hardest thing to do is get people over the hump. Um, and we're, we're, we're a smart country. We, we have a million ways of, of incorporating these things into our daily life. And the, that argument is unfortunately just often a blocker to actually confronting the question. I don't know if that's a fair answer, but that's been my experience. Right, thanks, Sean. Um, Louise, you've got something to add to this, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, certainly um, concurring with Sean's comments there, and I think um, we know we're starting to see more and more that delivering positive social and environmental um, impact within your business actually delivers commercial success as well. Um, Organisations are starting to hear different questions from their employees. Uh, around how organisations are delivering and connecting to the values of the community um, and, and those employees themselves. So there's a very strong link to retention and the recruitment of, of good staff by doing good. Um, but also investors are asking significantly different questions, whether it's around ESG, um, whether it's around um, your carbon footprint, whether it's around how you are contributing um, positively or how you are reducing your negative 
Um, and this is changing the game at the board level. Uh, and so it is proven, not only here in New Zealand, but internationally, that organisations that manage their ESG well and contribute positively actually financially are more successful. Um, and that has been shown over the last 10 or so years. Um, and so organisations are starting to act differently as a result. So tying positive impact to your commercial success is something that is happening already around the board tables. So if you're not doing that, you're probably not going to get good investment, you're probably not going to get the best staff, and you certainly won't have a licence to operate. Thanks. Thanks, Louise. Um, Tracy, there's a question that's come in um, from Adrian, I think. Um, to what extent do you think where infrastructure is integrated with nature, that infrastructure could be regarded by Māori as a creator giver, not a taker of life force? Mm. It's a great question. Well, we, we had that approach with the Pūhua to make, uh, work with motorway because we, we saw it as an important piece of infrastructure and we had to, we worked with it because um, it's, it's um, providing safe travel. So on that road, I don't know if you know, the death, the death toll on that road is massive. And even further up, we try to keep pushing to try and make it further up because the first one to get called is us to go and bless the land place where the people died. Plus also we saw it as a, um, it's not a, it got referred to by Mike um, from the Eastern Council as a highway, a holiday highway. But for, for us as Mark and Tato, it's not, it's our access to the world. So we do, you know, that's our pathway to the airport to the world to export stuff that we want to use. So it is around working together, but it's doing it in an appropriate manner to get an appropriate outcome. Thanks, Tracy. Berenice, I'm going to um, ask you this question that's just come up in the Q&A. Um, and it was sort of a little bit um, responding to Sean's comment about discretionary. There was a... Um, question about if work is considered discretionary, aren't we taking this message, aren't we kind of sending a message that says it's not appropriately valued? And I, I know that you've done great work with the team at um, Link Alliance around um, the work that you're doing. And so you might have something to add around that in terms of resistance to change and creating change. I think it's about intention. So. I don't see resistance. I see opportunity to share. I see uh, uh, really about opportunity to share. Through that, you can help to educate people. Sometimes it's just they don't know. And the simpler that you can make it for them to, uh, to apply it, they're going to do it. If you say to them, don't worry about it, I've got this, I just need you to sign this check. <laughs> or I just need you to endorse this. It's not going to cost much money. You know, you do whatever you can to get community support. But what they do like, what I've noticed is people like results. And we really, we're all about people. You know, when you tell somebody, look, look at this young person that's currently working in our office, that's uh, training to be a professional in IT, they take pride in that. So for me, it, it's not, not so much about resistance, it's just about the opportunity to share. Kia ora. Kia ora. Yes. One last question that I'll... Um, put to the panellists and maybe you can just um, uh, we'll do a quick round before we wind up for our session. Um, what do you think are the top three areas that industry should be focusing their effort on to drive positive impact for the recovery? Um, so the person um, here who's presented the question has said, you know, for example, should it be carbon? Should it be employment? Should it be water? What are the top three things for you? So I'm going to hand that first to Louise and then we'll go quickly around the team. Um, should be all of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that, you know, the, the thing that we can um, challenge ourselves on is what is the most impact that you can have and choose that or choose a couple. 
don't try and boil the ocean, um, mm. but really take steps forward in ensuring that you're not only managing risk, so you're not only managing those environmental, social and governance risks, because that's the license to even be in the game. You've got to be able to do that. But also where in whatever you're doing, whatever service you're providing, goods you're providing, is where can you have the most impact? Is it in positive carbon reduction? Is it in employment and supporting that, that you know, like um, um, Bernadine said around the, these extraordinary pilots, that if you're changing one person's life, that's extraordinary. So take a step forward. Uh, we can all do things positively and we can all, we all know that it's a journey. So, you know, don't try and do it all, just pick a couple of things and do it well. Cool. Sean, your thoughts? I think uh, employment. Uh, but I think we have a once in a generation opportunity to build some foundations for the New Zealand we want uh, and build some infrastructure that the country will benefit from. And they may not be the things that get the loudest noise at the moment. Um, I saw in Australia coming out of the GFC, a huge amount of money got squandered on the wrong projects and the wrong, with the wrong focus. It got everyone busy. There was very little legacy from the Australian experiment, experience. Um, it would be wonderful, out of coming out of this, we, we have a legacy that sets ourselves up to be the country we want to be in the future. And if we ran projects through that lens, I think we'd be doing different things. So that's, that's the challenge, is to spend wisely, get people into work, but build a New Zealand that we all want. Sarah, right. Sarah Nees. Do you have a top three or a top one or two? I, I have a top one and then I have this, this uh, I wrote it last week and it's He moni tā te mahi, he mauri tā te mahi, he mana tā te mahi. And so it's, it's this, um, you get money when you work. You get a certain energy, modi, when, when you work. And you get a certain sense of pride when you work. And so for me, it's employment. Uh, we spent a, a, quite a bit of time at the Link Alliance signing up, sending out contracts for people providers, labour hire companies. And at the top of the list were the Māori and Pacifica owned labour hire companies, because as soon as we can put people into work on the sites, the better off that individual is going to be, their family is going to be, their community is going to be, it's money back into the economy, employment. Kia ora. Kia ora. Tracy. Yeah, kia ora. I think it's all interconnected. We think in, secular, in a secular world where each one is connected to the other. Um, definitely around, um, I'll, I'll take probably what happened with one of the speakers on the breakfast panelist I was on um, last year. He spoke about um, allowing, the customers should allow the, the, the designers to push the boundaries around sustainability and, um, you know, go further than, than what perhaps you, your budget, you know, trying to look at exploring what's possible. Um, but it's all interconnected. Um, I think that uh, one of the interesting ones is actually they, they proposed to build 200 homes on Māori land in Tauranga. A lot of people against it. Um, they got built to do an economic impact report. $50, $50 million was the GDP on building 200 homes on Māori land. Because it's all interconnected. So the business creates the work, creates the families who got more money in their pockets and go into that relationship and whatnot. So yeah, yeah. Those, those are, they're, all, they're all top three to me. Sure. Kia ora, kia ora to all of our panellists and to those who have participated with us today for your great questions. Um, you know, I think we've been uh, challenged to seize the opportunity uh, to work in partnership with others, um, maybe some partnerships that are um, not partnerships we've worked with before, to kind of reach out, to connect, to find those um, people and communities to work with that will take us forward and to be bold. So I thank um, all of our speakers and panelists here today, Sean, Berenice, Louise and Tracy. 
um, and um, ISCA will be um, sharing some of the key insights from this session uh, more broadly through social media, etc. Um, we do have our next Connect New Zealand um, session, Connect NZ session on net zero future coming up on the 3rd of June. So for those who are um, keen to be participating in that conversation about um, what's the opportunity we have now to um, respond to the challenge of net zero by 2050 um, in New Zealand um, to come along and hear some panelists and have some discussion on that. Uh, let me finally um, thank everyone and hand over to Tracy who will close our session for us today. Sure, Patrick. Um, yeah, it's been a real pleasure and privilege to be here today and be part of this, this um, co-papa, acknowledge all the participants and all of those people, um, people who have participated here today. And keep safe, keep safe out there, look after our families, um, nor either. Um, let us pray. Ni noi tato. A kia tau kia tato ko tō tātou kia tato riki a hui tai ki. Me te aroha te atu me te kiki na tahi tana. A ki koe rau tato. A ke a ke. A mene. Kia ora. Kia ora o. Thanks, Kiri. That was good. Cheers all. So do we sign out thank now? You. Are we signing yep. out? Now we... We're signing out now. Okay. Yeah, all thank right. you, Kiri. Bye -bye. Nice to meet you guys. Have a good rest of the week. Yeah, Kira. Nice to see you. Kaguse. Mati wa.